Edwin, great to be with you today. Geraldine, really good to be with you. So when I think BlackRock, I think probably all of us in some measure have exposure through various ETFs, but you're on the alternative side. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what that business is? Oh, thank you. I'd be happy to. And very nice to, to be with you all. And congratulations to Anthony and the Soul team for getting such a, a crowd together and, uh, and, a great, and a great agenda. Uh, you know, we're, we're a little known organization at uh, <laughs> what, approximately eight and a half, nine trillion of assets. But I will say from an alternative standpoint, it's a critical part of not just our past, the present, but also our future. And we've spent the past several decades building what is today a, about a $320 billion alternatives franchise. Um, and that covers all the various asset classes. So if you think about us, maybe you think about us in the context of truly a global multi-alternatives asset manager, covering each one of the major asset classes from private equity, infrastructure equity and debt, real estate equity and debt, and, and a, a very broad credit business. Uh, private credit being obviously one of the key areas that we're seeing keen interest in as well. So when you put that together, including then about a $90 billion hedge fund portfolio, that equates to that 330 approximately dollars in assets. Uh, the thing that we do do is take pride in being part of this muscle that is BlackRock. And I think that has allowed us to have an extraordinary advantage in what really has to be for our clients an alpha space. Like this is about investment performance. And so today, within the alternatives business, we have thousands of employees that sit in 50 offices around the world. And in a world that is maybe less interconnected today than unfortunately it was some years ago, for us, it's really important to have boots on the ground in these economies, in these markets, and where we're making investments on behalf of our clients. So if I think about the, maybe the X factor for our alternatives business, it's really this network value that's created by virtue of the nine trillion in assets, the scale at which we operate globally, and being able to lean into that to give us this multiplier effect when we think about sourcing and finding these investments on behalf of our clients. So a uh, big part of the, the, the current, big part of the past, and certainly a growing part of the future for BlackRock as we build this business out. So you mentioned the nine trillion in assets, but you also talked about the offices all over the world. And it sounds like it's so much more than just an office, but the actual importance of having that presence globally to actually interact and transact in cities. Can you talk a little bit more about like why BlackRock has that advantage and what you really do mean by boots on the ground? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity set. Um, it's far from a domestic one. So I, I think about North America today. I, I still look at the, the challenges we're facing in the world. Um, the opportunity to invest well here still exists, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's still a very dominant part of our portfolios. And by the way, I think it will, that will persist for some time. But whether you're in an emerging economy or even a developed economy overseas, not having the local language skills, not being connected to the local market, not being a practitioner in the market, I, I don't believe you can fly in, fly out. I really think it's a flawed approach. Uh, but by being local to us as we measure what does success look like for us as we build these private market portfolios, is how do we originate, structure, underwrite exposure that actually our clients don't see everywhere else? Because part of that value proposition has to be, again, using that scale, that muscle, to give you access to something that truly is differentiated. And it's hard to do if you're not on the ground with those relationships. And, you know, some recent examples, um, when you think about being local, you know, if you think of BlackRock's heft, mm -hmm. so nine trillion, but we're a very big investor in the automotive industry, and we're seeing an extraordinary transformation in that industry. So we've invested, if you think about publicly traded car companies and component manufacturers, about $170 billion in that industry. That just gives us phenomenal insight into what the future EV market looks like, what the capex of Ford, General Motors, Tesla is going to be, their ambition overseas, not just here domestically. If you apply that lens into what we're doing, particularly in Europe, where we have a very significant presence th throughout the continent, you know, we partner up with them to try and electrify the continent. So with Ionity, which is a big investment you likely have read about, 
It allows us to put these supercharging stations throughout the continent to allow for mobility from Norway to Portugal. And so these are the types of things and the insights, if we plug ourselves into what has become this muscle, it allows for us to have a very unique perspective and view on how that can affect change, not just domestically, but certainly overseas as well. To me, that's just critically important because every investment comes with risk. Mm -hmm. We just need to make sure we're making the right investments at the right time and doing so prudently. Yeah, and what you talked about with those charging stations, especially on EVs, where so many people are saying, okay, maybe we do want to get there, but the how, and you hear people talking about the range anxiety where you show with these charging stations may not necessarily be a fear. So it seems like you're really able to drive change through alternative investing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's shocking the innovation that's happening. So if you think of our industry, uh, by the way, you all read the reports the same as I do. Sometimes I hear it's 19 trillion, sometimes I hear it's slightly <laughs> less. It's a big number. Um, and on all accounts, if you look at our institutional clients and our wealth clients, they're largely still under allocated to where they want it to be. And that being the case, it's forcing the industry to cons constantly innovate. I think as I look at our platform and how, he, how you know, maybe in the past you had large global funds, now you have thematic funds, regional funds. So it's, it's becoming very much akin to what has happened over the past many years in the traditional space. Mm -hmm. You have a menu of options, um, but that innovation I think is very good. I think the challenge now for all of our clients, whether you're wealth or institutional, how do you put that menu together? What are the right component parts given the challenges you, the clients, face? So how do you put that menu together? Or what should an investor be thinking about when they're presented with so many opportunities to construct a portfolio that makes sense for them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a tough one right now. Right, so the industry is what it is. Um, and, and I'm sure you've listened to a lot of the panels over the past few days when you're seeing this flood of capital coming in. Like competition has never been higher. And when you look at the number of asset managers that are within the alternative space, there's tens of thousands. So from a client's perspective, I think one of the critical trends that we're seeing is a bit of fatigue with working with the many, because when you're not getting the same level of transparency with the same degree of frequency in a digestible manner, how do you know what you own? Mm -hmm. How do you understand the current risks and how do those risks play out, not just in the future, but today? But then how do you build a portfolio for the future? And, and so a very big trend today seems to be this consolidation of managers and funds, but importantly, a critical demand for better transparency, a different type of partnership from alternative managers whereby the client can actually build for the future. So not surprising with the Aladdin system, that's really the foundation, the backbone for BlackRock that all of the investment professionals sit on we bolted on a, a technology platform and system and an approach from eFront. Mm -hmm. To us, that really amplifies our ability to take a look at not just public assets that are more liquid, but couple that with private market exposure, because it's no longer one versus the other, which means you know, this whole notion that alternatives are alternative is just is wrong. Yeah. Right? We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's core, it's essential, and I think what we have to work with our clients on is figure out, based on the fact that it is truly core, it is essential, how much, in what form, with what degree of illiquidity should you take as a client based on your objectives? And no two clients are the same. So I think the industry where we would profess to a client, oh, buy this fund, 10, 12 years, everything will work out, those days are dead, in, in my mind. So I think we need to be much more sophisticated with regard to our approach to why this makes sense in the context of the challenges these specific well, clients face. And you bring up a good point because I think everyone basically understands that the whole 60-40 notion is dead. I think you've said before we're looking at something more akin to 50-30-20. That 20 feels like a big percentage and can feel very overwhelming when you talk about an alternative space. Any idea, it will depend on the person, institution of course, but how people should be thinking about allocating that 20. Yeah, it's, um, by the way, th that's for the wealth side of the market. Um, 
if you look at the vast majority of our institutional clients, they are already, and maybe the most conservative being our pension plans, they're already from a private market standpoint at about 25% in mm -hmm. private markets. And then you, if you go to a multifamily office, a, an endowment or foundation, it's more like 50. With regard to wealth, across the globe, there's been a degree of inequity that's existed for some time. Right? There haven't been the appropriate structures. There's been a lack of education and transparency. And so I think the wealth market is very far behind what is the institutional marketplace today. Just didn't have the right structures or the access. That's largely changed. Now that the education is certainly picking up, and then you have other technologies to make it easier because people want convenience. Um, any of our partner firms will tell us they're looking to, with their advisors, encourage their clients to take the alternatives exposure to 20%. By the way, the average today, from what we can tell, is more like 4 to 5%. Mm -hmm. So in a tens of trillions of dollar industry that exists in wealth in North America, there's going to be an extraordinary flood of capital coming into the space, which speaks to, yes, the excitement that for an asset manager, as you think to the future, there's growth, but also the challenge and how do you continue to source the best ideas to deliver those investment returns that your clients have become accustomed to in the past? I think it's just such a change to you. You mentioned 4%, which I can't imagine really moves the needle on anyone's investments. But if you're talking on the private wealth side, um, you talked about some of the issues on transparency. What else can be done to educate investors? Because alternatives, it is a totally different structure with a to different risk set, different liquidity issues. Um, you want people feeling confident that they understand exactly what they're getting into, not just being kind of lured by perhaps a sexy opportunity. Yeah, I think the technology part is a critical part. Right? I think great people coupled with great data, with great technology, where you can derive insight is, is huge. So like, how do you transmit all this information to the many? Um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. So I, I grew up in a very small town in the middle of Ireland. Um, and you know, when you try to explain to my mother what I actually do, she's still like, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> But if you take some of the data and some of the research and some of the reports and some of the intelligence and you apply that to, well, actually, you know, here's what champions your retirement, it becomes much more personal, much better understood. The reality is in most people's retirement plans, BlackRock today, if you think about just the wealth market or just think about the people we try to help and influence in North America, we're working with 35 million people today in North America with their retirement, 35 million. And I will tell you, the vast majority are liquid and underallocated to alternatives. And so that's either through the pension plans, but it's also through our wealth partners that we're, that we're working with. We're working with them to use technology to help explain this journey and what really is the role of each one of these asset classes because they're quite unique and distinct. And you know, you hear a lot about alternatives being uncorrelated. Well, actually, some of them are, some of them are not. Um, so it's not a very even playing field. So as they step in, what's the appropriate asset class at this moment in time based on their objectives? And that's where I think that education is absolutely critical, enabled through technology. And I think, do think this data and bringing transparency to light and speaking in, not in the nomenclature we've become accustomed to in alternatives, may sound sophisticated and great, but it's deafening to the wealth consumer and just boiling it down to the basics of risk and return and, and how appropriate it is given their objectives. There's so much more work to be done. I do think the structures have changed too. So if you take Europe, we've been working on LTIF structures, European Long-Term Investment Funds. That was done in conjunction with the regulators. Mm -hmm. So they saw this inequity that existed that allowed for institutions have access, the ultra high net worth have access, but yes, everybody else has been left behind. It doesn't seem fair as you're trying to create wealth for the future and hopefully retire with some certainty and dignity. Um, and here in the US, you're seeing the same things. We've launched 40 Act funds now to capture private equity. It's new. It makes it much more accessible to you know, the accredited investor as opposed to the qualified purchaser. But that's going to take time. So much more work to be done. Yeah, and you do make a very good point on the lack of access in the private markets historically. I mean, it 
kind of was said that when a company went public, that was kind of like a passing the bag along when most of the upside was gone. So just curious, where do you see most of the opportunities in alternatives now, whether by region, by industry, or maybe by structure? We've been very fortunate. I think every single part of our business has continued to attract flow, but it, this is all about investment performance. Um, and I think when you can continue to vintage over vintage, demonstrate that there's a unique approach and ability to preserve and protect those assets, but also importantly make them grow, that's allowing everybody to you know, garner confidence and, and lean in. Um, you know, we look at each one of the asset class, and I would say the two that just feel most underinvested, and that's where I do think you'll have a, probably a disproportionate level of growth, infrastructure, equity, and debt. Mm -hmm. For many of our clients, particularly in the wealth side, they have zero exposure to this asset class. And for most of our institutional clients, they have some. It's growing, but it's still nascent relative to the other asset classes. But you look at the need that's around the world, it's measured in trillions. Uh, and the reality is, the attributes of that investment, the resilience, the yield, the diversification, it is long duration. So, I mean, if you think about your liabilities not in days and weeks and months, they're measured in decades. This asset class measures up very well, particularly too in an inflationary environment, because there's a form of inflation hedge as well. So I think very underinvested, still not necessarily well understood. And, you know, we've all talked about this energy transition that's happening globally. Like, energy transition, what's required is $125 trillion of capital to, by 2050, accommodate this net zero future. That's in excess of $4 trillion a year. As a capitalist, mm -hmm. I think about, okay, if that much money needs to transition to help this across all industries. This is not just about large energy companies. This, is, this permeates through every industry. I see that as a massive, massive opportunity. So I think infrastructure for us is really much there at the center and the forefront of an opportunity set that should be embraced more. Credit, particularly private credit. Um, you know, we're obviously a very large public equity uh, and fixed income manager too. When you look at the universe and the investable set of opportunities there, on the private side, it's far greater. It's measured in the millions versus the tens of thousands. Um, and on the credit side, with how banks, as we all know, have retreated, how asset managers on behalf of our clients have become the new lenders of choice, you still see an ability to help influence positive change, but it requires smart people underwriting the right management team in business and deploying capital the right way. But I think those two feel not just underinvested, but very much from our vantage point, areas where you can build resilience in your portfolio, deliver yield, income, return, and just things we need in today's world. Yeah, I think you make a very good point on the infrastructure front because I think in common speak, most people think roads and bridges, but infrastructure isn't just about kind of fixing what's there, it's also making kind of the future possible, it yeah. seems. So we are close to running out of time. Just last question for you. Um, obviously, we've come into a very volatile time in public markets, um, which sometimes does have a trickle-down effect into private markets. Anything investors should be thinking about just for maybe what opportunities they want to get into now or just feeling safe and secure with what the investments they already have? Yeah, there's a, a lot is happening. And, and we'll, listen, when you, when you look at the investment landscape, this is not a time to just withdraw. This is the time to continue to invest. So we're not slowing down. In certain areas, we are. Like on, on the large side of the market and PE, when you look at multiples and valuations, there needs to be a, an adjustment. Things are still quite rich. But on the, on the smaller side of things, pricing has moved. Valuations have changed. And actually, there's great entry points. Uh, I, th I think about some of the, th the things we're looking at now. Um, you know, we made an investment. We're in New York in a company called Revel. I love this firm. Um, you should load the app. <laughs> it's a mobility, ride sharing. They've got this wonderful sky blue colored car. These are all Teslas. But actually what Frank did with the CEO of, of Revel is not just create a, an organization that provides mobility to largely populated areas like New York and other big cities. What he's doing is actually electrifying the city. And what that means is he's building charging stations with 
local government to allow for what isn't, you're not seeing today, enough people driving EVs, yet the demand is there. So I, I look at the mobility aspect of what he does, the charging stations, which is open network, and I kind of look at an abundance of opportunities like that that we're seeing, where companies want BlackRock and our client's capital to be there, but I think these are opportunities that will be resilient in the current market, but also in the future. So I think maybe the word to the wise is, we'll probably have to work a bit harder. Volatility is here to stay. Inflation is far from transient. Um, and we still continue to have geopolicy issues that will persist for quite some time. So we'll work hard. We'll continue to invest hopefully smartly, but I th we still want our clients to invest more in alternatives. It's, it gives better balance to their total portfolio. Fantastic. And I will be paying more attention when I see those Revel vehicles on the roads Please in New do. York and hopefully you won't get run over by one. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much. Fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, Edwin. Awesome. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank all. you.